clear on your end. Okay, this is Stanley. I will be actually your presenter okay, for this webinar. So before we start, um, probably in approximately about a, a minute from now, okay, I, I'll just want to run through with you very quickly about this topic, okay, how it comes by. So this topic itself um, is not new to us because this is the second time that, that I'm actually broadcasting this. However, with revisions of case studies, okay, the first time we had this was during the circuit breakup in April. And it was actually an idea that came off my, my head, okay, because I would like you to hear a bit more about what innovation is all about and also how the average person on the streets could be actually using that to their advantage to reconstruct, okay, new um actually innovations right so um in, in a minute's time I, I will be starting very soon but i thought it's important for you to know a bit more about me okay before we actually go into the brass types of things okay and um i hope everybody can hear me loud and clear so far so i would really appreciate if someone can just respond to me okay in the in the webinar chat if you can't hear anything from me at all right Okay. Okay. So a bit of, about myself, right? Um, obviously, this webinar is not about me. It's more about you. I would like you to walk away with some very meaningful stuff. Okay. Uh, uh, a lot of enhanced knowledge about what innovations are about. Okay. Um, a quick one through about some of my profiles. What I've done. I've taught at the undergraduate level. I've taught at the postgraduate level with US universities, with British universities. Um, today, I'm managing faculty teams as we speak. Um, my research interest will be very much in Asian innovation as well as international expansion and growth strategies. Right? And um, I'm also actually the, the editor of um, actually some journals, publication itself. So you will be able to, to look a bit more about what has been done so far academically. And last but not least, well, a bit more of my academic credentials. Okay, I, I started actually teaching innovation roughly about six and a half years ago when innovation was something that is very badly misconceived and per uh, perceived as well, especially in Singapore because the word innovation itself is being abused and, and innovation is very close to my heart, uh, mainly because it's something that I've been teaching all this while and even six years later on, things are not really very much improved. So before we go into that, um, I think it's important for me to set certain expectations. Okay, so that we are all online. Okay, we will start actually at four. Okay, um, I would like the audience to post questions either in the webinar chat or during the Q&A session at the end. So in between, you'll be best if I could finish what I have to say so that you, it doesn't pull back anyone. Okay, and finally, I will also be using selected case studies and application okay, to help you to correlate, to localize, or even contextualize some of this innovation. Okay, time is obviously not working for me. I only have about one and a half hours. Um, it's a very, very tight timeline for me, especially given the amount of work, um, things I, I have to share or I would love to share. But let's try to see what we can do, okay, to make this a meaningful one and a half hours, right? Okay, so let's actually start, okay, uh, by running through with you a bit more about Okay, this topic, um, corporate innovation secrets of successful unicorn companies. Okay, um, obviously there are some keywords here. Uh, one big keyword is innovation. The other keyword itself is unicorn. Some of you may have heard about this terminology of unicorns. So what are unicorns? In, in old, actually, folk tale, unicorns are actually legendary creatures. Okay, that's found in storybooks. But in the modern corporate world, unicorns refers to something else. So today, what I intend to do is I will walk you behind the scene to look at some of these unicorn companies, okay? And what are some of their secrets or techniques that they're using to improve their business cycle or their business process, right? Let's actually first demystify the key buzzword, okay? What's a unicorn? Okay, unicorn in the corporate venture capitalist world is known as a venture-backed private equity, okay, technology company. So what do you mean by venture back? That means it's funded by venture capitalists. 
and it's privately owned. It's not publicly listed. Okay, and they are always valued at at least a billion dollars USD or more. Okay, many people when they hear about unicorns, they get really excited. But I'm not very excited with unicorns because it's pretty common today. Uh, there's about 486 unicorns throughout the world. There are space over 27 countries. So Singapore is home to three unicorns, right? But besides actually knowing unicorns, I think it's important for you to know the different types of unicorn. So unicorn is $1 billion and above. We have Defcon, which is $10 billion, right? And Hextocon, which is $100 billion. At this moment, we have a lot of Defcons, but not a single Hextocon. Okay, so that is something that's really out of the world. So who are these unicorns? Okay, which are the companies I'm referring to most of the time? Okay, this will be actually your Total. So who's Total? Um, I'm, I'm sure you actually hear a lot Total nowadays. Okay, TikTok. The parent company of TikTok is Total. It's a China-based company. Today, they are valued at some 5 billion. Okay, Didi Chuxing, which is the equivalent of Grab. Right, and once again, China own 56 billion, okay, based on April's valuation. Stripe, okay, which substitutes itself for credit card companies like Visa and MasterCard, is an alternative to all these credit card companies, right? It's 35 billion. These are top three, okay, unicorns. And plus a lot more, like Airbnb, okay, you have actually PayTM, EP Games, where it gives you actually uh, a lot of actually modern online games as well. And of course, not forgetting the only unicorn that's based out of Singapore, Grab. These are the top 10 unicorns around the world. So what's very, very much common about them, they are all considered innovative. How innovative, okay? That's the main purpose of why we're actually having this webinar today. We are going to walk you through behind the scene to hear a bit more about some of these techniques or tactics that they are using. So with that, I will have to demystify the second keyword, innovation. What's innovation? A very, very big buzzword, a very, very exciting word to use. However, many a times it's used in the wrong context. Okay. Uh, if you ask me, this is my favorite definition or the, probably the most accurate definition. Innovation is actually considered the recreate, uh, creation of a viable new offering. So innovation, many a times people get it confused. Okay. They correlate that to invention. It's not the same. Okay, When you invented something, it's not considered innovation because it doesn't have commercial value. There will not be any takers or any commercialization behind this invention. So a lot of people will start to think about innovation, uh, invention, but here um, you, it's definitely not the same. Okay, And you shouldn't make them the same as well. Okay. Second, it has to be viable. So what do you mean by viable? Vi viable means it has to be financially sustainable. It must be able to capture its own value and yet, okay, entice customers to pay you for that, okay, particular item or their particular service or even their particular offering, value proposition. So viability means it must be paying its own bills. It must be able to bring you to the promised land of greater financial gains. And then new. Okay, people say, oh, you, you know, innovation must be new. However, okay, a lot of innovations that you see in the market, they are not new. They are probably new to a country or a city, but they are copied, okay, or they are borrowed from other industries, or they are actually mirrored from another continent. So here, when we say new, it may not be new to the world, but it can be new to a market or industry, right? So it's possible that you go into another sector which is so unrelated to yours, and you can use some of these ideas, superimpose that back to your own industry, and it's still considered innovation. Okay, last but not least, the last word, offering. Okay, when I talk to a lot of my students on innovation, many a times, they will always tell me the same thing. Uh, Stanley, offering means product, service, or process. Yes, you're not wrong. However, this is only three types, okay? of innovation possibilities. We need to examine beyond this tree, okay, to go into actually systems, okay? We need to look at services, we need to look at processes, we need to look at business models, okay? Innovation today is not just actually about your physical product, neither is it about us, just a service, neither is it just about process. 
we are looking at many different possibilities. And that's actually the reason why this webinar becomes really important because I'll be walking through with you all of this, okay, that relates very much, okay, to the topic. Okay, so another very interesting question that I do get, okay, uh, before when I was teaching many years ago, people tend to ask me, okay, Stan, I'm not, in way, not a very innovative person. I'm not a very smart person as well. I'm just an average person, you know, holding a full-time job. Uh, innovation, leave it to the big bosses, leave it to my directors to look at it. Well, I guess um, it's time for you to rechange that thinking because even when you're an entrepreneur, when you start small, you will have what we call a founding innovation. It's that one single idea or that one single product, okay, that in you introduce the market where people like the features and are willing to pay you for that. So that's what we call founding innovation. It not, need not be groundbreaking, but it must bring you that first dollar, okay, and that's founding innovation. As the company grows from a small size to probably a medium size, that's when you start to hire middle managers. Middle managers would have to invest in what we call incremental innovation. And when they look at incremental innovation, they are looking at it from either a product perspective or a process perspective. Okay, that means make the product better and better. Okay, add more features. Okay, change your functionality. All right, or process-wise, oh, let's actually do more cost savings. Let's cut certain actually redundant um, actually steps. Okay, so that is actually what we call incremental innovation. But as a company continue to grow from a small to becoming a medium, okay, that's when we invest a lot more in radical innovation. Okay, when a company starts to uh, adopt, okay, a board of directors. And in this board of directors, it's really small, maybe three or four person comes together to take the leadership. Okay, and that's when they look at radical innovation, also known as disruptive innovation. They need to go out the market to tell the market, I have something else that's very different from my audience, okay? And we are here to grow further, okay? And finally, you, when you're actually your company gets more and more successful, the board of directors will be a lot bigger. That's when the C-suites, okay, gets assembled. You have your CFOs, you have your CMOs, you have your CTOs, CIOs, CHROs, etc. So they come into the enlarged board and they together, they look at organizational innovation, all right? And as a company state continues to grow, going to public listed, so and so forth, they will start to hire chairmen, CEOs. So chairmen and CEOs, they look at strategic innovation. Okay. So if you look at actually this slide, okay, you will realize that actually innovation is not something that just pertains to the person right at the top of your organization. It is something that even the people in the middle or at the bottom will be able to inspire or to actually to discover. So I would like you to walk away to understand that innovation is not just meant for the people who are holding top titles in your organization, but it's something that relates to everyone, right? Okay, other types of innovation. Okay, I'm gonna run through this very quickly. When the market becomes very, very mature, when your entrepreneurial capabilities evolve, you start with individual entrepreneurship all the way up to corporate entrepreneurship. And these are the types of innovation you start to invest in. Incremental innovation, Radical innovation, organization innovation, strategic innovation, and last but not least, domain redefinition. Okay, domain redefinition to a lot of you may sound a bit alien because you don't come across this terminology very common. Uh, but however, it's exactly what the government is saying every day since the COVID situation comes about. It's known as disruptive innovation. Okay, also known as digital transformation. Right? So domain that redefinition is exactly what the companies should be doing today, especially if you want to survive, you want to thrive into this actually disruptive world. Right? So we actually look at innovation using business model canvas. This is actually what we call a nine box okay, of innovation. And each of these boxes represents a key activity or a key feature of an organization. It has to be collaborative, intermingled, and integrated as well. So when companies look at business model, it is very easy for you to say, okay, you know, my business model is this and that. However, if you're trying to explain to someone who's not in your company, things get very challenging. So that's when the business model canvas comes to the rescue. They allow you to make sense, okay, to integrate, to show a bird's eye view 
of what innovation is all about or what a business is exactly doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So in, in this webinar, we will obviously not be coming too much about business model canvas because I already done that uh, roughly about a month ago in my earlier webinar. So that can be found on YouTube. Uh, but we are going to examine each of these innovations that relates to the business model, right? So with that, I need to use my favorite book, okay, 10 Types of Innovation. This book itself was published in 2013. So in, even today, you can find copies of this, okay, in Kinokuniya, in Action Times, okay, or even online Amazon, or even Book Depository. It's not a new book, but I love the contents because is really, really actually cutting edge at that time. And I still use this book very much in terms of my teaching because uh, it's pretty profound, okay, if you are really interested to know a bit more about innovation. So I will need to help you to dissect this entire book, okay. This is the 10 types of innovation, examine on a linear scale, okay. So we have actually the blue boxes, right. These blue boxes that's actually on the left side, all right, and then we have the middle ones, okay, and then finally the, the those that are on right inside. Okay, let me introduce you very quickly to the one on the left, that means the blue boxes, what we call a configuration. Okay, this configuration are usually found internally within your organization. Okay, that means your customers don't really care about them, but you need to get this up and running before you go into a market or before you start business. You need to know how to earn your money. You need to know how to connect with others. You know how to structure your things around. Okay, your customers are going to see this, the, the orange box on the right, as well as the, actually the lighter orange in the middle. These are the ones that's customer facing. Okay, and these are the ones that customers will be very, very concerned. They're not interested to know how your back end function, but they're interested to know what they receive. So in 10 types of innovation, we look at each of these boxes, okay, in totality. And through this, each of these boxes, we are going to examine the techniques and the tactics that successful unicorns use, okay? So examples, okay, once again, if I present it in a different format, okay, in layman's term, we will go through things like Gillette, Target, Zara, so and so forth. So that is actually something as a bird's eye view, all right? But in order for us to go deeper, we need to examine each of these boxes. So let's start off with the first business model, okay? The first profit model. So profit model, profit model innovation, what exactly are we looking for? In layman's term, we are interested to know how does an organization make money? How does an organization earn its revenue? Okay, and how can it earn its revenue in a very unique or very different manner? Okay, here there are 12, Okay, profit model innovation. And in the next slide, there will be another nine. So total, there's about 21, okay, innovation tactics, right? Very, very commonly, you'll see uh, ad support. Ad support are exactly what you see, like in the form of Google AdWords, okay? Auction, okay, auction is when you actually put something that's valuable, okay, and then you'll get your customers to beat, outbeat each another, okay, for that product. And usually in the auction arena, the price, of that service or that product is way higher than your minimum bid. Okay, eBay's do this pretty much. Okay, uh, even actually certain websites they, they will actually put a very limited item and they'll allow people to outbid each other. So the the person who offers the highest value obviously wins the auction. Okay, what company that uses this very 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 well? Um, I I believe you have heard about this company called Supreme. Okay. Supreme does this extremely well. So they will always put limited items. Okay, it could be a merchandise, like for example, a jacket or a basketball with the Supreme logo printed on it. And they'll display on their website, they'll invite consumers around the world to bid, okay, for that limited item. So the highest bidder gets that eventually. So auction is one very interesting way, okay, of growing your profit model. And then you have obviously licensing, bundling, Okay, so in actually in this slide, you realize that some of these are very, very common. Uh, but I just want to highlight some of this that, that uh, some of these actually profit model innovation because it's not probably right in your face. Force scarcity. Okay, if you look at this one, what's force scarcity? That means I artificially ma manipulate the demand and supply of this particular good or service. Apple does this really, really well. 
Okay, so what does Apple do? Apple will always tell you that, okay, I'm going to release the iPhone 12. However, there are limited um, actually editions of that, limited quantities of that. So they will announce this release date way in advance. So something like about nine developed cities or nine developed countries. Okay, so if you want to get your hands on the latest uh, Apple 12, okay, iPhone 12, you need to go to these cities. So they are literally forcing people who are iPhone lovers Okay, to go to these cities. So that's one way. The second way is that they will say, okay, yes, it's there, the price is high. However, I have limited quantity. So everybody queues up overnight. Okay, you can queue overnight, you're willing to pay a thousand eight for the next iPhone series. But yet, Apple knows this really well. They know that every time they launch an iPhone, people queue overnight. People don't mind to even fly to another city to get that. So why is it that they can't increase okay, the production? The reason is for scarcity. They want to make it artificially appear as if it's really, really actually sought after, even though it's really sought after, but they want to inflate that even further to make it as if it's off limits, okay, off reach to many consumers. So people who are dying to get the iPhone, you'll constantly wait, anticipate, when are you going to lay your hands on the next iPhone? So inevitably, in the process of that, the price will never drop. Okay, it will stay forever, be the same price. So for scarcity is what Apple uses a lot. Okay, another one that I would like to highlight is freemium. Okay, freemium, as it suggests, it comes from the word free. Okay, it's a combination of the word free and premium. So freemium means some people get to enjoy the product free without paying a single cent. Others who want better services would have to pay a lot more. Okay, so how can you see freemium in everyday life? Your Gmails are freemium model at work. Okay, you will have uh, a lot of games, online games, okay, online streamlet games, okay, multiplayer games, which are free as well. So you can just register for account, you can play as if you are, you are actually any other ordinary member. But if you decide to lay your hands on equipments, get um, actually more advanced um, features, you have to start paying a certain amount of money. So Freemium works on that model and it's one of the, actually the most exciting way that technology companies are going towards right and then finally i have this small little thing here called a float so what's a float um a lot of you would have this easy link cards with you okay if you take public transport if not i'm sure you have some form of cash cards or whatsoever that is using the idea of a float okay so the idea behind a float is i have this small little membership card every now and then i will top up a small amount say ten dollars into my easy link card or my cash card but I don't use it immediately. I won't exhaust the value immediately. This $9 will forever be in the card. So the, the value itself is captured by the card. So why is this a business model innovation then? It's a profit model. Because the company that collects this $10 will not, okay, they will not just sit back and leave this money in the bank. Even if they do leave it with the bank, the bank will pay them interest for this $10. Okay, so they're earning the in-betweens between you putting money in your card and then putting this money in the hands of the banks to earn the minimum interest. So they're earning the in-betweens. So floats, okay, surprisingly, a lot of people don't, don't really know much about this profit model, but it's very heavily used by retail shops, very heavily used by food courts, okay, as well as your transportation companies. So the next time when you take out your Easling card, remember, it's a float. Okay, profit model in place, right? And then I have to speed up a bit more because we are still in the first uh, profit model. There are others like, for example, metered use. You pay by the minute, okay? You pay for how much you use. If you're not using it, I won't charge you. But if you are, I will have to charge you by the hour. Okay, Zipcar is one of this. They are a car rental business. But instead of you being charged based on a daily basis, they charge you by the minute for every meter or for every kilometer that you travel using their cars, okay? And that is actually one of the most exciting ways that you see. Today, a lot of actually car rental companies are moving away from the monthly charge or the weekly charge. And instead, they're going for daily charge or if not, distance charge. That is what we call a meter use, okay? So in Singapore, where can you see this? It's all everywhere, okay? Look at your PUBs, okay? Your public utility spot, okay? They charge you your electricity by the meters. So that is already something that actually has been around for a long, long time. It's one of the oldest methods of charging profit business models.
Okay, and then finally, we have actually things like, for example, switch mode. Okay, so you see this thing, switch mode. So what's a switch mode? Switch mode is a multi-sided platform. Okay, what do you mean by multi-sided platform? Uh, P customers, uh, one pool of customers will only go to this platform or this website if another group of customers are there in the first place. So the value of this platform becomes bigger. It's also what we call the network effect. Okay, when a group of customers are here, the other very different group of customers on the other side. So this platform functions as a switch board. They connect these two group of customers together. And in between, the switch board earns its first actually dollar of revenue. All right? So these are some of the very, very exciting ways that the companies are using okay, in terms of profit model innovation. Um, people who use switch board will be people like Grab, okay? Airbnb, all right? uh, even TikTok, or even Facebook. Okay, or even actually Instagram. So these are all modern switch bots. Okay, so the mechanism of this, uh, I will not deep dive too much. In fact, I already covered that in the previous webinar about a few weeks ago. So if you are interested, I will, I will actually advise you to go back to my first webinar, all right? Okay, let's look at Gillette, okay, Gillette. So a combi that has been around for hundreds of years, okay, what is so interesting about that? Okay, if I would help you to dissect this complaint, they're adopting what we call incremental innovation. So how incremental are their innovation? Okay, they charge you uh, blade refills instead of the razor. So this is what we call the razor handle, all right? It usually comes with a complementary razor blade, okay, just one piece. So that is what we call a full razor, all right? Okay, so you realize that actually the cost of this razor handle plus the blade could be something say about $30, all right, $30. But when you go to actually the NTUCs or your um, any type of hypermarts to get this, they only charge you like maybe $20. So the cost to make this is $30, but they're selling it to you at $20. So in business context, it doesn't make sense. I'm making a loss of $10 for every single blade that I sell, not to mention the logistics cost. So why would actually a company like Gillette do that? Okay, Gillette adopts what we call the in-stock base. Okay, they would want you to actually use it even though it's loss making. They want you to have this product and they're going to introduce very high switching costs. Okay, so high that you will not want to go to an competitor because it's inconvenient, it's expensive, and yet, okay, it's incompatible with your current handle. So, you realize that Gillette's head blade handle system is unique. No other blade refills can go into Gillette's razor blade. Okay, so in that process, Gillette charges you for blade refills. So this small little blade refill, four pieces, will cost you 30 bucks. Okay, how much does it cost with this to, to produce this blade refill? Maybe $5? So they make 25 bucks for every box of blade refills that, that you actually, that you purchase. So earlier, they, they could make a loss on the razor, but when it comes to blade refills, they are going to make back whatever they lost in the beginning. And in the process of doing that, they force you to stick with them. It's what we call an in-stock base, okay, profit model. So some other companies could have used this. Later, I'll give you another example. Okay, uh, premium prices. The more blades that you have, the more costly it is. They have two blades, three blades, four blades, five blades. So some comes with actually uh, aloe vera. Uh, they claim that it is going to be a small, smoother shave whatsoever. So the more features there are, the more expensive the razor blades will be. Okay, so that is another way that they charge. They use premium pricing. And then finally, when you're using two blade, three blade, or four blade razors, okay, the price is always different. Okay, obviously, the more blades they are, the more expensive it is. Okay, so is Gillette the only one that uses this? No. You have other companies that uses this very well as well. Think about your printer companies, HP, Canon. Okay, they could sell their printers to you at a fraction of what cost. But how are they going to make back that money that they lost when they were selling you that printer? They are going to earn that money back through the multiple refills that you're going to buy, the cartridges that you're going to buy eventually. So this is actually what we call in stock base, okay, coupled with premium pricing, okay, in, in Gillette's example. All right, another example which is uh, quite badly affected now, of course, SIA. Uh, but SIA actually, yes, okay, they are not probably having the best of times, but when they were doing well, okay, and mainly they have been doing well all these years, okay, it's because of innovation. Okay, they have introduced what we call a uh, 
premium economy class, which is a sandwich class between the economy seats as well as actually the business seats, okay, business class seats. So premium, premium economy. So what's so interesting about that? It's actually a sandwich class between these, and in that they promise you, you pay slightly higher, slightly more than economy class, you get more room space, you get your you get chances to choose uh, from a more wider variety of food items. You have a bigger in-screen, you have actually your individual power supply, okay, to charge your phones whatsoever. And they like to actually tell you, okay, uh, it's actually just a, a more comfort for a fraction of the price, okay, of the price. And people who like that, okay, would actually sign on to premium economy, but they may not be willing to pay for business class. Okay, so this was actually a form of innovation introduced okay, by SIA as a response to increase competition from the middle class or uh, from the Middle East Airlines as well as Cathay Pacific. Okay, SIA was not the first actually airline to introduce um, premium economy. In fact, they were one of the last to introduce premium economy. Okay, so they borrowed this idea from Cathay Pacific. Okay, that's working. That's based out of Hong Kong. They look at actually in the Middle East companies, people like Emirates, like Tata Airways. Okay, they decide to borrow this idea and put it back into Singapore's context. And that's how actually SIA called their uh, premium economy class, right? So second uh, type of innovation we are looking at networks. Okay, so what is network innovation about? It's about collaboration. How you work with other companies or other organizations to get mutual benefits. So that in, in this actually uh, innovation, there's a need for a win-win solution. Or it cannot be a win-lose solution because if it's a win-lose solution, the parties will not come together to work, to work hand in hand. So in network innovation, these are the 10 types, okay? But once again, because of time, I can only focus very much on a few exciting ones. Okay, strategic alliances, that has been around for a long time. Okay, that's when you see two different companies trying to come together, shake hands, and say, let's work on a project together. Okay, you have a collaborate, collaboration. You could have a complementary partnering. But I want to point you to cooperation. Okay, cooperation itself is one of the most interesting and the most emerging ways of network innovation. Okay, here in this context, we have two competitors, competitors A and B. Okay, so uh, in normal times, they could be going after each another's stroke, okay, for a market share or for revenue um, actually gains. But in certain cases, these two competitors, complete A, complete B, although they were actually competitors, they decided to come together, okay? They want to collaborate. They want to actually bring um, the, the competition to a different scale. So competition has been around, um, in fact, it has been emerging every now and then. Okay, where is competition right in your face? Uh, some of you who could be technology um, actually lovers, if you have gone to Simlim Square, you will see cooperation happening right, as you, right in your eyes. You go to a game shop okay, or an IT shop, you ask for this particular device or this particular actually, um, software. They probably don't have it, but the, actually the person who serves you says, you wait a minute, okay? let me go next door or let me go to another outlet to get it from you. And then surprisingly, this service staff just literally goes to the competitor next door and pulls off something that you wanted and gives it to you. And they charge you the revenue, okay, the money for that. So that's exactly competition that's right in your face. Okay, you could have two competitors coming together to, to work hand in hand to win over part of the market. All right. Um, and you have, of course, of course, franchising. Okay, you have open innovation, secondary markets, and supply chain integration. So let's look at actually open innovation. What's open innovation? Open innovation is when, okay, I as a company, I invite the public to give me ideas, to give me suggestions on how I can make this um, business better. Or I could be looking for new ideas to bring this forward or to create new achieve business propositions. So people who are complete strangers to the business are encouraged to put forward their ideas. Lego does this really well. Lego actually uh, has millions and millions of fans around the world, right? So they actually pass the ability, the community ability to Lego lovers, okay? Yeah, you can always actually try to create new actually um, models, okay? Or new designs using my Lego bricks, okay? And once you have done that, I would love if you could share that with the rest of the world, another lo uh, Lego lover from the other part of the world. Just take a picture, post it on my actually Lego community network, 
and then the rest of the world will be able to see that. So that's how Lego gets a lot of ideas. Okay, and the ideas were not even from their scientists or their researchers or their engineers. It was from people like you and me who love Legos and we started experimenting and trying to put different things together. That's where they get the ideas about actually the Lego cities, about the Lego actually kingdoms, so and so forth. So open innovation is one way where you could encourage people who are complete strangers to come to you and to allow you to open up okay, your value propositions. Right? Let's look at Airbnb as a case. Airbnb, okay, they link holiday makers with homemakers uh, for short-term lodging. In some countries, yes, they are deemed as illegal, but this business model will not go away. And in fact, Airbnb does not own any assets. They do not own any properties. They do not have housing uh, accommodation um, under their wings. They are just a network. They are just a platform. So earlier I mentioned about actually switchboard. Airbnb is such a switchboard. They connect holiday makers, that's our first audience, okay, people who want to go for holidays, with homeowners. In this case, these are usually private homeowners. So you have one audience, holiday makers, second audience, homeowners. And what's in for them? Okay, short-term lodging. So to the holiday makers, they will earn, okay, actually what? Cheaper accommodation in the country of their choice where they decide to spend holidays. To the homemakers, they will earn extra cash, okay, or extra dollars and cents because they give up their homes to the holiday makers during their trips. So Airbnb looks at that, uh, is very disruptive and it's so disruptive that it has caused a lot of concerns, okay, to the hotel industry. All right, to the uh, resort industry as well. And even in certain cases, right, it has caused a lot of issues to property markets. Okay, so Airbnb excels in that and it's also one of the top 10 unicorns in the world, right? Okay, so what exactly do they use? Okay, it's actually a switch port. Okay, uh, Koi and Grain, this happened during the COVID circuit breaker. So Koi and Grain, two very unlike, okay, actually companies. One is purely online, green is purely online. So if you want to buy food or any type of dishes from green, you have to go to their website. They don't have a physical shop. Uh, and then Koi obviously is one of the top favorites, okay, that uh, Singaporeans love. Koi has physical shops. But during the circuit breaker, okay, all bubble tea chains are not allowed to operate. But yet Koi needs to keep its revenue going because otherwise it will lose its friendship, okay? is actually customer base to other bubble tea shops. So in that, they were struggling, they were desperate. They need to find a solution around that. And they found a interested partner in green. So what is the win-win proposition? Okay, in actually, um, in green's case, they want to have wider market awareness, okay? They want to have extra revenue, but they wouldn't want to run the risk of having many, many physical um, shops, f &B shops or outlets. And more importantly, they do not want the sunk cost. Okay, because when you open up a retail front or a F&B joint, you have to pay rental. You have to pay staff uh, salary. You have to pay for equipment, so on and so forth. And Green doesn't believe in that. Green doesn't want to actually absorb any of that. So they only have a small little centralized kitchen. Okay, and in this centralized kitchen, they'll cater to the whole of Singapore. Right? So they were looking for two things, wider market awareness and more revenue, yet they don't want actually the miscellaneous cost, right? So Gwen was looking for a partner. And here comes Koi, okay? What was Koi looking for? Koi was looking for a permitted premise to operate. They want to actually still roll out, okay, all their bubble teas, sell that to interested customers. And they were not allowed to operate. They can't even open up their shutters, okay? So if they don't find a partner who shares common aspirations as them, they will lose their customers to who? To Gong Cha, okay? To all these actually other bubble tea players that's operating out support, like, like for example, Ali, so on and so forth. So Koi was actually looking for someone who shares the same concern, okay? And in that, both companies found each another to be very, very compatible. And that's why both companies decide to shake hands and say, okay, let me offer the Koi bubble tea, okay? When you decide to bought, order any food items from green. Okay, and subsequently for Koi, what do they have to lose? I got a place to, to actually roll my bubble teas. I got a place to keep my customers happy. 
And yet at the same time, I don't really need to be under the constraints of having to shut down, right? So in this case, you see a win-win collaboration, okay? There's collaboration efforts at work. All right, the third type is what we call structure. Structural innovation, also known as DNA innovation. In layman's term, we say that it's about how you organize your assets, okay, in very different ways or very unique ways that creates value. So the key word here is value. What's value? Value is always in the eyes of the consumers, okay? In structural innovation, we are looking at a reconfiguration, okay, or the maximum optimization of your assets. So in that, we have nine possible techniques, okay? Asset standardization, competency center, corporate universities, decentralized management, incentive systems, IT integration, and of course, knowledge management, so and so forth. Okay, in this, I would like to point you to asset standardization. Okay, many people say, you know, uh, every business should be different. Every outlet should have its own differentiation. Every actually different um, organization should have something unique. I do agree, okay? But when you have too many outlets, okay, there is a need for you to formalize and to standardize certain things, especially when it comes to assets. Okay, McDonald's does this really well. You walk into any McDonald's, okay, the golden arch french fries looks the same. Okay, they're prepared pretty much the same as well. There's a golden rule of preparing french fries. It's actually six and a, uh, it's three and a half minutes, by the way, for people who are interested to know how McDonald's french fries comes about. Every cheap McDonald's outlet, okay, they will use a standardized french fry fryer, they will use vegetable oil, and they'll fry it at a certain temperature for three and a half minutes. Nothing more, nothing less. That's standard uh, asset standardization. And we go to all these um, actually McDonald's outlets, you realize that they use a lot of warmers as well to keep the food warm. In the past, when I was young, when every time when I walk in McDonald's, they would like to actually keep all this food for 10 minutes maximum. And once it goes beyond the 10 minutes, there will, uh, the staff will start to throw away all these food items. Okay, today they are smarter than before. They use actually thermal warmers to keep all these actually patties, to keep all these eggs warm while waiting for the next customer order to come in. So in asset standardization, what's in for McDonald's? McDonald's could use actually a very standardized equipment, a very standardized process, okay, and replicate that quickly across the island or even across the world. And when you do that, when you do a standard asset standardization, you're saving a lot of unnecessary wastage. You're saving a lot of repair costs, right, or maintenance costs. And that's exactly what is in for them. The more technology driven you are, okay, the more there's a need for asset standardization, right? And then we have other things like competency centers, okay, and corporate universities. Um, in a lot of MNCs today, they know that they are good in a particular industry, and that's why they become huge. So they decided to use this to their advantage. They start to open up universities or centers of excellence to allocate other competitors in this area of operating, okay, of business operations. And they'll cascade this value to them by teaching them the ropes. Gone are the days where competitors must go at each other's road or they must keep it as an edgy in-house uh, secret recipe. Okay, corporate universities are going to change that. And we're going to look at some of these uh, corporate universities later on. So there are many other things like, for example, incentive systems. How do you pay your people? How do you reward them for performance? Okay, I'm going to share with you a, a case later on, how a localized company changes the whole incentive system, right? And of course, you have other things like uh, outsourcing, okay, that's been around for a long time. Let's look at the case study, okay? Very familiar names, Grab. So what's interesting about Grab, okay? Grab offers a very unique incentive system to attract riders and private car owners, okay, as dairy partners. So for every dairy that is made, okay, by their partners, they will receive a portion of the revenue, right? But what's in for actually for Grab? Grab will charge commission, okay, of this delivery. So Grab keeps a portion of this actually order price as commission. That's actually from the consumer's perspective, they keep a portion. And to people like the riders, they will charge, okay, also a commission, usually about 20%, okay, given back. To actually grab. So grab becomes a middleman. I charge consumers, I charge my partners. And to make it even more interesting, all these bags that you see, okay, all these apparel merchandise that you see, all these are payable as well. Okay. So grab says, okay, you know, if you have actually caught certain targets, you have met certain number of deliveries, 
I will give you extra payouts in the form of incentives or a wave of certain rentals uh, if you're using a grab card. So that's how they actually keep the system going. Once again, it's a, it's a switchboard. You connect two different types of customers together. They see value in each another. Grab stands in the middle and Grab says, thank you very much, money on both sides. Okay, but in return to keep both customers happy, they will have offered discounts, they will have to offer extra bonus payouts. Okay, and Grab uses this very well. They look at how they incentivize. Okay, they are delivery riders. Okay, on and on, some of you may not be too familiar. On and on is actually a local ID company. Okay, started by Mr. Ong Si Boon. So who's Mr. Ong Si Boon? Mr. Ong Si Boon is actually the elder son of Mr. the late Mr. Ong Ting Chong. Okay, one of the former um, president of Singapore. So Mr. Ong Si Boon, he's actually an architect, okay, who has very little business um, actually exposure. So when he started on and on, he says that, well, you know, I know a lot of ID companies itself usually will have a centralized HR, and the centralized HR will be the one that decides the remuneration system, does, does a payout, the, mod the bonus issuance, etc. He doesn't believe in that. He deconstructs all these HR policies and all these um, remuneration system. He gives the power, okay, to the project directors. So each of the projects, whether is it an ID project or is it a renovation project, the project director who's appointed by Mr. Ong will have absolute power in determining how much bonuses, how much salary increment, how much um, actually bonuses to issue to the staff. So HR in Ong and Ong is just an administrator. They are not the ones who set a policy. And imagine if you are actually operating in on and on, and you're the business owner, isn't that a nightmare? Your project directors can dictate how much and when to pay out bonuses anytime. And isn't that actually very, very challenging? But yet, on and on tries on that. Okay, by not giving power to HR, okay, they decided that the team lead should take on increased power and they should be the ones who decides okay on hr policies and innovation and in that on and on stands out because they have very very little staff attrition in fact there was literally no attrition staff attrition for a solid three years okay in the past and this is actually one of the ways that hrs would have to reinvestigate okay is it a must that you must keep to the traditional hr policies or can you actually abolish the traditional rules and go into something more exciting right so on and on a very low class company that tells you a lot more about what they can do and how they've done it differently, right? Okay, um, this is a picture that's all in Singapore. Some of you may not be too familiar. Uh, I can't blame you because it's really, really isolated. Um, this is actually found in Bona Vista. So at the onset, when you look at this picture, it looks like a chalet, right? Some of you will agree, it looks like a chalet. It looks like a membership club. You know, it, it could be, even be passed off as actually a resort on Sentosa Island. Um, this is Unilever's Four Acres, okay? So what's Four Acres? Four Acres is a leadership development facility for Unilever. And in this actually Four Acres, that's how it gets its name. This Four Acres is where they train all the top leaders for Unilever worldwide. And Unilever invested 50 million to build this actually campus from scratch. It's found off Bona Vista very close to the current MOE headquarters. And all Unilever top executives will spend a week okay, in this development facility where they look at emerging strategies, they look at ways of growing their, actually, their growth plans. Okay? And Unilever names four actors as a corporate university. Okay? So today, Unilever is not the only one. You have a lot of others, like for example, uh, even Facebook have its own Facebook Academy. You have Microsoft Academy, you have tons, okay, like for example, you have uh, even actually Alibaba has its own. They call it Alibaba Business School, okay. So today, a lot of corporations, especially the big MNCs, they are all developing corporate universities, right. So what is in for them? They would use this corporate universities to inculcate the right values, the best practices, and the most sound, okay, business decisions in their leaders. Okay, and in that, there's a standardization okay, of processes and knowledge throughout the entire corporation. So Unilever is just one of them. There are many others. Okay, even Disney has its own. They call it Disney University, right? Okay, the fourth type is what we call the process innovation. So we have covered actually quite a number. We have covered profit model. 
Okay, we have covered network, we have covered structure. Now we're into the fourth type. That's process innovation. And based on process innovation, we are looking at how to add value or change okay, your usual ways of doing things. So a lot of actually people who are like administrators, media managers, this will be very, very important. Because every day when you walk into office, you're always trying to crack your head, trying to find new ways of cutting costs, trying to find new ways of minimizing um, documentation. This is where process innovation comes about. Right? So these are actually the um, 14 ways that process innovation manifests itself. Um, I would like to point you to crowdsourcing okay, and crowdfunding. So these are the two most popular ways okay, of going through process innovation. In the past, when you have ideas okay, or you want to find new ideas, you have to go into a boardroom meeting or you have to go into a management meeting. You invite people within your organization to give suggestions, to review different methods. Okay, of doing things. But crowdsourcing goes completely different. Crowdsourcing is when I ask strangers, people who are not even familiar with me or not even part of the company, to give me suggestions, to give me resources, to give me actually recommendations on how I can grow my business or how I can internalize certain ways of doing things. So crowdsourcing is actually one of the most popular way today. So if I need actually a designer, okay, would you need to hire a full-time designer? No, you can go to actually crowdsourcing platforms like Fiverr, okay, where you dictate your budget. Say you offer $50 per project. There will be designers around the world, okay, or even students or even retirees who are gifted with design skills who may want to take on your project for a fraction of what you will pay to hire an in-house designer. So crowdsourcing is very, very exciting and it allows you access to a lot more ideas. Earlier, I mentioned Lego. When Lego gets a lot of design ideas, it was through crowdsourcing. Okay, so Lego en engages in process innovation as well. So what's crowdfunding? Crowdfunding is when I have a business idea. Okay, however, too bad I don't have the funds. I'm quite poor. I would like people to give me funds. Okay, and I can't be hoping for the government to give me donations or grants. That's when I go to crowdfunding websites like Kickstarter, where I put forward my business idea. I share it with the rest of the world. Okay, donors in this case, I tell them this is the way that I'm going to design okay, my business. I'm looking for this amount of funds to jumpstart my business. And donors who goes into the website, looks at your idea, they love it, you'll start to pledge okay, some donations. So once it reaches a given amount, crowdfunding work, the project will go live and you will get this amount of money that's promised by the donors. But the only catch is that you have to give them something you can either in the form of a product or in the form of shares. Okay, so crowdfunding works two ways. However, no longer will you need to go to the banks or to actually go to the government sectors asking for funds to jumpstart any business. So crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, very, very exciting. There are other things like, for example, localization, okay, on-demand production, where you can buy anytime that you want. Coursera uses on-demand production. The product, the cost is there. Anytime you're willing to take out your credit card and start paying, the cost is at your disposal. You have primitive analytics, okay, and that's where big data comes about, trying to predict what's your next purchase. Amazon, eBay, okay, uh, Grab, okay, or even all these Lazadas, okay, your Alibabas are all trying to predict, okay, through your purchase behavior, what lies ahead and what are the things that you probably will love. Right? So there are many others, okay, uh, unfortunately in, in the interest of time, I can't cover everyone, but these are some of them, okay. Let's zoom into actually case study, okay. Uh, Bosset, some of you may not be too familiar. Bosset is actually a Swiss company. They, they are a manufacturer and they manufacture only two types of things, nuts, okay, and bolts, okay, fasteners. They're in the fasteners business. So. Some of you may not be too familiar, but their products are found everywhere, especially every day when you take the MRT trains. Okay, all the MRT trains, whatever boats and nuts that you see in the MRT trains, okay, in our Singapore's MRT train, is coming from Bosset. Okay, some of you may be more familiar with military equipment, but like um, those produced by Singapore Technologies. Okay, all the tanks, all the armor vehicles, all the artilleries, they use a lot of boats and nuts, right? All these boats and nuts are produced by this company called Bosset. Okay, so Bosset is a Swiss company. Okay, the headquarters are in Clementi Industrial Park. Okay, and I had the luxury of visiting their warehouse. And this is exactly how the warehouse looks like. Okay, 
So in each of these boxes that you see, okay, or all these small little blue containers, they call it the smart box, also known as a blue box. Okay, the blue box has only one use, it's for storage, to store all these bolts and nuts. And when you have a whole warehouse full of millions and millions of nuts, each worth about maybe one, two grams, okay, which is weighing about one, two grams, who wants to go into their warehouse to do stock taking? And people who are in warehousing will know, stock take is the most problematic and it's also the most time consuming process in any organization. BOSAC decides to turn things around, okay? Each gram, okay, each boat and nut costs about, uh, it weighs, weighs about three grams on average, and the diameters are actually pretty much within zero from one to up to three cm. So they cost a specific gramage, and they will also put all these um, attributes and nuts into the blue containers. So each blue and containers would have a weight, because once you put all these boats and nuts, there will be a weight, right? And this black stuff below is a wing machine. Okay, and if you think that actually the smart bins are only performing the role of just containing the boats and nuts, weighing them, you're wrong. This is connected to a centralized system, okay, known as a, a warehouse decision making and storage system. So they integrate JITs, okay, with this actually uh, blue box. Uh, so how do they do that? Okay, so for example, you could be actually a, a salesperson in Africa, right? So you are actually selling boats and nuts to probably the, the government, one of the governments, okay? And the government says, okay, I, I would love to buy from you. I will need maybe four times of these boats and nuts, okay? The salesperson, by logging into the iPads, they will be able to go into the, the warehouse system and look at how much storage, okay? How much, how much actually excess capacity they have in terms of spare boats and nuts. And, and through this JIT system, they will be able to actually convince okay, the customers almost immediately. They will actually say this, okay, you know, I have like four tons of boats and nuts of these diameters and weight okay, in Singapore. It will take roughly about two weeks for me to ship to you. I have the storage right now, okay, easily. So hold a minute. This is not a warehouse professional. This is a salesperson who's based in Africa. So how did he manage to know that Singapore has the actually the stock in place. That's because of the blue beans. The blue beans are all connected to a centralized JIT system. And this JIT system, once again, is accessible by smartphones or any apps. So at one stroke, you are empowering your salespeople with the ability to commit okay, to stocks and with the ability to commit to delivery timelines. Okay? And yet, nobody else is involved in the conversation. Right? So, BOSAC does this really well. So, if you actually look at JIT systems, it's not just about knowing when the stocks arrive, but it's also about using it to enhance your warehouse keeping capabilities. Right? So, another one, Timber Group. Okay, this is actually an FMB group. Okay? So, you see this machine in the middle? All right? So, they use okay, drones. This is a commercial drone. Right? And this commercial drone um, is used. Okay, it has been pilot tested, good to go. In timber, they use this drone to deliver food items, okay, when you're in the restaurants. And um, this drone is actually a commercial drone, so that's why you can see four, four fans, okay, to lift it, to do the heavy lifting. And you will fly to your table, all right, and you can just pick off the dish, okay, and place it on your table. So it's very much uh, human, human free, manpower free as well. The only catch, because it's a commercial drone, okay, it has a load. And this commercial loan drone can only hold up to 2 kg. So nothing more than 2 pints of beer. Okay? Otherwise, the whole drone may just collapse. So it's really dangerous. But do you need a pilot license to fly a drone? And, and look at this guy on the right. This guy is actually just uh, could be another um, actual operator. Okay? Or maybe even a waiter okay? who's using this to fly food items to their clients. So in, when you look at automation, automation itself is one of the fastest way that automation could lend itself into other businesses. And in that, commercial drones are getting a lot of limelight. Amazon, eBay, they are all looking at drones to do delivery services. Okay? And Singtel um, tried to actually look at that as well. However, the most successful so far in Singapore is Singpost. Okay, Singpost actually about four years ago, they used commercial drones for a pilot run 
when they try to deliver a parcel to Pulau Ubin with no humans involved in the whole delivery process. So it's just one person who's con controlling the system using a commercial drone to deliver a parcel to Pulau Ubin. And the pilot run was successful. So it seems like the days when actually drones are going to do the parcel delivery business are pretty much nearer and nearer to us. So these are ways that you could look at automation to start with. Right? Okay, the fifth type is what most people will tell me every other day. Uh, it's about process, it's about product innovation, how I make my product better and better, how to increase the functionality okay, of this product. So here in layman's, we are looking at how to design, how to develop these features, and how to increase the functionality. Okay? So there are 12 types okay, of possibilities here. So you have customization, you have ease of use, okay, you have environmental sensitivity, you have focus, so and so forth. But I would like to point you to customization. Okay, so how, how customization can help you? You are designing your product around a specific customer's need. Okay, think of a tailor that is actually doing customization, taking your measurements, knowing your height, okay, knowing the shoulder, shoulder length. So they are actually designing everything around you. It's so actually tight fitting that you probably know you can, cannot get this product anywhere else. Customization is the way to go. And that's why when you visit certain websites, like eBay's, Amazon's, Grab, so and so forth. The moment you log in, they address you by your name. So why your name? Because they're trying to do customization. And behind this entire network is another big data okay, system where they will try to predict your buying, buying behaviors. So customization is very, very, very actually common nowadays. Okay, and I would like to point you to Paul Park, a very, very old school company. I mean, I remember my grand grandmother using this when I was young. Okay, so what's interesting about Hopa? Hopa sells what we call the medicated oil. Okay, so very, very old school. Okay, uh, I don't think youngsters nowadays would have this in their handbags. Okay, it is not a modern accessory per se. Okay, especially the older version. Okay, which I don't think you will have that as well. But it's a very effective product. It has been around for decades. It's been proven to reduce medical ailments. Okay, and in Hopa, uh, Hopa did something. They know that their product is losing traction, especially among the young and trendy. If youngsters are not even buying this anymore, eventually their business will die out. And 80% of the revenues coming from how Park Corporation comes from this particular one product, the medicated ointment. Okay, so Hopa needs to react. Hopa needs to do something to rescue its market. So what they did, they actually go into the local universities and the local polytechnics. They invited four polytechnics and three local universities, uh, undergrads, okay, they got them involved in an arts competition, okay, a design competition. Um, each university or each institution dominates a team of five people. Comes with this actually competition. And in this competition, they have to design a series of possible products using the same medica medicated ointment. So the eventual winning team was Thermasic Poly, a year two polytechnic student. Uh, where it comprises of 18 years old and 19 years old. So what have they done? They use actually the medical ointment to create a series of products and redesign in terms of packaging and usage. Okay, so no longer it's just medical ointment. They come into actually pastas, they go into mosquito patch, they go into actually pain relievers so and so forth. And guess what? The winning team here has given Hopa Corporation a multi-million dollar worth idea. Okay, and Hopa today it is modernized very much. Okay, and what's a winning prize? What's a trophy for this group of 17 year old and 18 year old? A $500 prize money with a small little trophy. So, who's a, who's a winner here? Uh, is this actually the polytechnic students or uh, is this actually Hopa Corporation who's ripping millions off this competition? So, here it's possible when you can modernize a product, okay, using the same actually ingredient but looking at different possibilities. So that's product innovation, also known as product performance innovation. Same product, but coming out with many different multiple uses of it, right? Okay, uh, so something related to product innovation will be what we call product system. So product system is actually like a platform where I would need to provide you, okay, with a common actually um, landing page or a common website where different products or different items can come together for synergy, okay? So in that, there are six ways. You can look at complements, extension, which is very commonly used by technology companies, modular systems, uh, product bundling, platforms, etc. 
especially platform. So earlier we talked about a lot about Alibaba, we talked about Grab, we talked about Airbnb. Okay, um, these are all what we call product platforms or service platforms, also known as multi-sided platforms. So what is in for them? Okay, so compliments. Okay, they usually are compliment. So here um, I have an image of Microsoft Office, something that should be quite close to most people's heart. So what's different about Microsoft Office? Each of these items, say Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, Microsoft Excel, could be purchased as a standalone, say for $100, right? So if you decide to buy four of this, it will cost you 400. Four times 100 is 400. But Microsoft, okay, can sell it to you individually, but they don't. They would like you to buy it as a bundle. They'll tell you, this is Microsoft Office, right? It's actually, if you get all four or whatever you see on screen, it's only going to cost you $200. That, isn't that a steal? Individually, if you buy them, it's $100 each. But now if I have everything here, I'm paying just $200. That's exactly what Microsoft wants you to fall into in terms of a trap. Okay? They bundle individual items together. They make it into an integrated system. They sell it to you a lot more than what you're prepared to pay. So you could find that it's cost saving, but actually you're falling into the most traditional method of bundle, of price bundling, where you were originally prepared to pay 100, but in the process of me using bundled uh, actually pricing or bundled innovation, I've convinced you to part with a lot more than just 100. Okay, so you end up paying 200. Originally you were just wanting to spend 100. So product bundling is very, very common. So which other companies use okay, this besides Microsoft? Okay, McDonald's. Surprising was the one that used money. Think about Happy Meals. Think about all these value meals that you're using. You go to any McDonald's, okay, you say that you want a french fries, um, just a pack of french fries, which costs you about two bucks. Okay, the next thing that they're going to do is they're going to upsell to you. Why don't you take actually maybe a meal? A meal is going to only cost you five bucks. It comes with a burger, it comes with drinks. So why do you want to pay two dollars for french fries? So, and then you'll be like, yeah, but the burger costs $3, the drink costs one fifty, so it should be six fifty. And now, if I get everything, it, it only costs me 5 bucks. Isn't that a cheap cost saving of one fifty? And then you decided to ditch the idea of buying just french fries, and you go for value meal. That is where product system has gotten the better of you. Okay? So in today's context, don't sell products just as a standalone, especially when they are complementary. You could actually look at repackaging bundling things that were originally selling as a standalone to put them together so that people end up buying more okay and you also get to earn more revenue so a lot of actually companies today use that the bigger they are the more likely they are going to use product system bundling okay also known as product system innovation right so service okay this is actually the number seven innovation is known as service innovation not just applicable for service industries, it's also applicable for all the product-centric companies and uh, sectors. So in service innovation, we say how to provide and, and support okay, value okay, beyond your usual products. Here we are looking at the intrinsic, the intangibles okay, of business. In service innovation, there are another 12 types. Okay? So we have concierge, we have guarantee, okay, we have precise service, Okay, we have also user communities, try and try before you buy, and total experience. I'm going to focus on concierge. Okay, so concierge, what's concierge innovation? Concierge innovation is when you go beyond the extra amount to give something that consumers were not prepared to receive in the first place. For example, you walk into any retail shop, very commonly the retail staff will run up to you and say, okay, how, how can I help you? And then you say, oh no, I'm just looking around, etc. So what if the retail staff turns around when you were paying for your purchase and they say, you know what, uh, you don't really need to bring it back home. Let us send it to your house at no extra charge. That's a concept service. I'm going beyond. You bought something for me, yes, I appreciate your gesture, but let me give you something beyond what you were expecting. And concept service was actually a way to differentiate between the retail stores. Okay, and in today's concept, concept has morphed a lot. You use concierge, okay, to entice customers to stick with you, to differentiate yourself against other similar off offerings. Okay, so concierge is one way to engage in service innovation. And then, of course, earlier I mentioned about personal service, where platforms try to actually address you by name. They will try to predict the colors, 
Okay, and if you are using Google like what I'm doing, okay, to search for information or you know actually articles, okay, you just like Google can be customized according to your favorite whims and fancy. You can change the color, you can change the color, the setting, you can change the image, what's and so forth. So that's personalized service. Okay, the the most actually um interesting one here is actually trial try before you buy, also as trial and purchase. Okay, but if you look at some books. Is what we call bait and hook. So what's bait and hook? I must put something of value to you, okay? And when you start to bite, just like a fish, when you bite the bait, I will pull you in, okay? It's like fishing. I'll pull you in, I'll convince you to buy something more than what you're prepared to part with. Okay, where do you see um, a bait and hook? You see this in hypermarkets, supermarkets, they use bait and hook. All these promoters, food promoters, they will give you a small little bite somehow to weed your appetite. And once you actually taken a bite, they will ask, naturally comes out the next question: Will you want to have a pet? So this is actually very conventional. It has been around. So how do actually companies today, especially unicorns, use this? Unicorns itself, they will offer you a free trial period. Okay, if it's a tangible company, they'll tell you, okay, you can use my platform for twenty one days. Uh, you can use this complimentary for the next one week or so. No questions asked. But if you decide to stay on with us, that's when we start to charge. So trial and purchase is one of the most commonly used tactics by unicorns okay they always give you an opportunity to try out a product or a system think of that how many of you do need to pay to download the app nobody pays right okay but eventually when you first make your booking your very first grab car booking and your or your grab taxi booking you're hooked because no longer will you want to stand by roadside and then flat off a uh, actually a vehicle or a taxi because it's so convenient you were hooked because of convenience and because you already made the first purchase okay you find it very difficult to, to let go of that right so let's go into a bit of the case study here we are talking about Zappos Zappos itself delivers happiness okay and Tony who's the CEO of Zappos eventually it was being bought over by Amazon so what did Amazon see in them and Amazon paid 1.8 billion dollars US dollars for a company that less than three years old, and that's Zappos. And Zappos, if you go ahead, back to the history of Zappos, Zappos is online based, it's a retail shop, it's just like Alibaba or um, Lazada. They only deal with one type of products shoes. Okay, what type of shoes? Lady shoes, all types of lady shoes of all brands and all sizes. Okay, they use the platform to deliver actually high heel shoes, sport shoes. Of flats to ladies, okay, and delivery is free. So, what is interesting about Zappos? Zappos, in their first one and a half years of operation, they tell all the ladies in the US, uh, feel free to place any orders, we will send it to your doorstep. That's concept service. I'll send it to your doorstep. Uh, any colors that you want, okay, let us know, we'll try to source it around the world for you. And that is not even actually very groundbreaking. What's groundbreaking is, is their customer service. So assuming you go to Zappos, you, you found actually this particular um, actually pair of shoes. You like it very much. You place an order. Okay. And in many retail actually platforms, eventually stocks will run out. Okay. And the moment actually, even though it has run out of stocks in Zappos warehouse, Zappos will match that dollar okay, that, you, that you agreed to pay. And they'll go around the world to source for the same pair of shoes and same measurement, even though it costs them a bomb, just to keep you happy. So you get your pair of shoes based on the price that you agreed to pay, even though it costs them a lot more. And to make it even sweeter, they send you the home. Okay, they send the shoes to your home. If you're unhappy, you can send them back. Zappos will pick it up. Okay, you don't actually need to even pay a single cent for delivery charge. So that was how actually ladies eventually caught on to this. And it was a number one retailer of lady shoes in the US. Okay, much stronger than even Amazon or eBay. Eventually, Amazon saw this. Amazon, Amazon bought over Zappos because of this 1.8 million worth of customer service impact. Okay, and today is one of the most exciting ways that you can actually go about uh, interacting or enticing your prospective customers concept service okay and also going beyond the norm right so one of the last ones okay channel channel innovation involves you working with others 
In short, uh, in the business context, we say how do you get your market, okay, get your products to market? How do you distribute, increase your distribution networks? How do you look at new ways, okay, of spreading your product um, distribution? So there are 11 ways, okay? So we have content-specific cross-selling diversification uh, experience centers, okay, which is very new as well. Flagship stores. So where do we see flagship stores uh, in Singapore? You go to Changi City Point. Okay, all the big brands, retail brands, have a flagship store there. And they say that, oh, you know, you can't get this product anywhere else. Uh, you can only find it in um, Changi City Point. We have the largest variety of apparels or merchandise in Southeast Asia, all found in the same place. Victoria's Secrets, okay, a brand that used to be operating in the United States, have a flagship store in Orchard, downtown Orchard. So what do they actually commit okay, to customers in this part of the world? They say that, oh, you know, we are the one and only Victoria's Secrets original store in Southeast Asia. So we carry the widest change of merchandise. So if you're interested, please come and visit me. Gone are days where you need to, actually as a retail firm, you need to open up multiple outlets around the island. Okay, it's like mushrooms. You don't need mushroom your retail outlets around the whole island, just to be a customer base. You can actually go into a different form, which is flagship store. You tell your customers, if you want this, come and look for me. And why should you come to this store? Because it has everything else that other stores do not have. And it's the one and only. So you're selling as a, uh, exclusivity, uniqueness. So people will still tend to go to you. Okay, go direct. This is when you are actually a producer. You're trying to cut out the middleman. You're trying to go into uh, directly to the consumers. Okay, some of you, like me, okay, who appreciate food very much, uh, you realize that many of your food items are coming from farms or plantations around the world. In Australia, okay, um, which is also a very much uh, agriculture-based um, actually exporter. In Australia, they, all the farmers, they form this, the Australian Farmers Association. So Australian Farmers Association decides, okay, to gather all these farmers, okay, and when they collect all these fresh harvests, every morning, they would actually sell it direct to consumers and deliver it to the doorsteps of consumers. So in between, they no longer need actually your supermarkets. They no longer need your specialty stores. They'll go direct to you. And today, many actually businesses would prefer to go direct. Um, Dell was the one who started this. They went direct to PC consumers and users and said, you know, I don't need a retail store. I don't need a middleman. Let me sell to you directly. Tell me what you need and I'll sell it to you in the quantities that you requested. So go direct is very, very popular today. And why is it popular is because to, the, to actually the producers, they can earn higher margins, okay? They have a stronger control over the consumer segments. But to the consumers, they enjoy more savings. So the role of a middleman is being compromised when actually corporations decide to go direct, okay? Especially um, the distributors, okay? Eventually, you'll find themselves in a very, very actually uh, challenging situation. All right, so this is actually another one which is building up very quickly, and then of course on demand. Anytime you want it, you just take out a credit card, you pay, you can enjoy that. So a lot of actually softwares, a lot of services today are based on on, on demand, especially courses. Even courses today, you no longer need to wait for me. Say I, I'm your faculty, you don't need to wait for me to be present in the classroom to deliver to talk to you. You can just actually go to the website, okay, just pay, and then you can go through all these videos. Okay, anytime, in, even in the wee hours of the morning. Okay, the last one for channel innovation is pop-up presence. Um, this is actually borrowed okay, from a very, very old business model. In Singapore, a lot of you have heard of Pasar Malam. These are temporary night markets, which appears in neighborhoods for usually about two weeks or a month. The pop-up presence was borrowed from the, actually, the um, Pasar Malams. So how does this evolve? Okay, retail stores, Okay, they could be ha having a fixed outlet, say, in Jurong or in, say, Tampines. And then they decided, say, okay, I don't have a physical shop in, in Orchard Road, but I'm sure there will be some of my customers who go to Orchard Road once in a while. I can actually create a temporary shop, okay, using a kiosk or a, a temporary store, okay, to sell my merchandise during the, these two weeks. So in these two weeks, I'm there to build up the awareness, to ramp up, okay, the purchases. And... They actually tell their prospective consumers, I'm only here for a limited period of time. So if you want to buy from me, please buy from me during these two weeks. Otherwise, I'll be gone. 
So proper presence are being used by a lot of actually retail, a lot of F and B joints today. Okay, they appear where you least expect them. Okay, um, Old Chunky uses that very much as well. Every time there's an event, you see the Old Chunky actually van appearing. And that's just a road that was being blocked off. And you see Old Chunky there selling all this actually fight stuff. Okay, um, to actually to help you to satisfy your hunger. So proper presence has been around. It was borrowed once again from some of the very old industries. And today, a lot of businesses are looking at proper presence to increase their awareness and their patron. Okay, so Panasonic, okay, a lot of you know them as actually consumer electronic giants. They still are. However, Panasonic realized that there's a lot of new mileage okay, when they decide to go into vegetation, farming. They're going to actually modern farming, urban farming. So Panasonic, okay, started to use their factories, okay, uh, and look at some of these lettuce, all these spinaches. They decided to go them in an ultraviolet, okay, environment. And this is what is actually found in Singapore. Okay, so if you look at actually some of these uh, fresh greeneries that's produced, they cost a bomb, by the way. Okay, a Panasonic grown organic vegetable, okay, will cost around ten dollars a bunch in comparison to the normal ones that's imported from China, which cost maybe about $2 a bunch. So why is it so expensive? Because they are not using any fertilizers. They're good organically in a lab environment. Okay, All right. And then we have Nespresso. Some of you who are coffee drinkers, Nespresso is actually something that you've probably heard of or you're very familiar with. They are the ones who created what we call the capsule coffee. Okay, and when Nespresso first started, they were only available online. They were just a website. Okay, if you want to get an espresso uh, brewing machines, you want to get the capsule coffee, you must take out your credit card, visit their website, place orders, and then wait for them to deliver to you. There was no physical shop run. Okay, and Nespresso was not just web-based. They look at actually channel distribution. Nespresso went into channel distribution by looking at possible reach. Okay, how they can maximize that reach. So what do they do? They actually look at specialty stores. So today, there's a lot of Nespresso team boutique stores across Singapore, okay, where they sell nothing but Nespresso brewing equipment and capsule coffee. They went to the airlines, okay, because a lot of you who want to have a cup of coffee when you're taking a long distance flight. So they actually convinced the airlines to stock up capsule coffee as well. And they also go into direct or online ordering. You can just buy direct from them. You don't need to go into retail front. What's the most interesting here is Nespresso Chef. Academy. So what's Nespresso Chef Academy? Some of you who could be very, very fond coffee drinkers, you may be able to tell the difference between cappuccino, lattes, okay? I can't, okay? You could tell the difference between the, the actually the different aromas, okay, the different origins of the coffee. I, I can't. But if you go to Nespresso Chef Academy, you can be certified as a Nespresso Chef in just a day. Okay, they will give you actually all the different types of coffee that's available, show the characteristics, okay, one through with you about the characteristics and the difference in each of these types of coffee mix. Okay, and then end of the day, they will actually give you a test. Okay, they'll blindfold you, they'll put you to actually through this test where they'll just let you sample two types of coffee. And then if you can tell what type of coffee it is, you are certified. You become a Nespresso chef. I did not know that chefs can be created in a day. Now, Nespresso has redefined the meaning of chef. Okay, chef takes years to train, but coffee chefs, it takes a day. So Nespresso, why would Nespresso want to set up this academy? Because they realize people who have certificates, people who like to call themselves chefs, likes to display that, okay? Or likes to boast or showcase their certifications to others. So when you actually, you become a Nespresso chef, you will not keep quiet. You will share with your friends, you share with your loved ones. You will say, oh, you know, oh, you know, I go to Nespresso, spend a day, and then now I'm, uh, I'm a Nespresso chef. You laugh about it. But that's exactly what Nespresso want you to do. They want you to spread the word. They want you to share with the rest of the world that there's such a thing called Nespresso chef. And indirectly, you're building the brand. You're building their awareness, okay? And for a fraction of the price. And by the way, if you go to Nespresso chef, it costs you less than hundred dollars, right? So just actually, at, at, for a small price of hundred dollars, you walk away with a certification. Nespresso walks away with a bigger game in mind. You just got yourself certified, and you're going to use this certification to spread the word on their behalf, right? So channel distribution becomes very, very exciting. 
So the, 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 la, the, actually the second last one is brand innovation. So in brand innovation, we are looking at how you communicate your offerings. Okay? How do you actually go out to convince your customers to tell them how unique you are as a provider? So there are different ways. Okay? Earlier we talked about Nespresso Chef, where it's a form of a certification. Okay? Microsoft, all the tech companies itself nowadays, they run a lot of professional certification. It's for you to spread the word, to share with people that you're an expert. Okay, in this edge systems or in these softwares or in these products. But the idea behind this certification goes beyond. They want you to help them to promote their bigger brand name. Okay. Uh, Co-branding, okay, MasterCard, Visas, does a lot of collaboration with supermarkets, uh, does a lot of actually uh, collaboration with even training institutions or academies. So when two different companies come together and say, okay, let's have a very unique uh, Visa card. Say for example, you see MasterCard, partnering with DBS and partnering with Takashimaya, that's when you get your DBS Takashimaya credit card. Okay, so co-branding, there's something to gain for each of these players. So for MasterCard, they will be able to tap into Takashimaya's audience, customers. And indirectly, they could also use Visa to spread their brand. So co-branding is very, very common today, right? Uh, component branding, okay, usually this is found in um, technology equipments. For example, you, if you're using handphones, mobile phones, some of you could be using Samsung phones, okay? And some Samsung phones would use very, very outstanding components. For example, Leica lens, okay? Leica lens is actually one of the best lens used for cameras, digital cameras, okay? And when actually your phone producer tells you, oh, you know, this is powered by Leica, okay, by Leica lens, they're trying to sell you based on component branding. In this device, there's this component that's really outstanding, if not the best in the market. Okay. And in the in actually the mobile device um, industry, somebody will tell you, okay, um, my actually screen protector is different. It's by Gorilla. Gorilla Glass is actually almost impossible to break. Okay. So they will tell you using all these actually sub uh, providers to brand, to co-brand the, the actually the whole gadget. And Intel was one of the strongest push behind laptops and desktops today. How many of you will really settle for something less than Intel? Okay, will you really go for something different? Okay, or will you prefer to stick with Intel? Or actually laptop manufacturers or desktop manufacturers will they sell very heavily on the fact that Intel chips are inside that laptop. Okay, and this is one way that you can use component branding. Okay, private label. Okay, private label is very commonly used. Uh, especially in the, in the FMCG business, fast-moving consumer goods. Private label itself is when I produce on your behalf, but I do not let the world know that, oh, I'm the one who produced this on your behalf. Okay? So for example, medication. A lot of medications itself are produced by um, actually private pharmaceutical companies okay? under a big brand. It could be Watson's, it could be Gardet's. A lot of the vitamins that you consume today that you purchase from Watson's uh, or from Guardian are private brands, okay, are private labels. Watson, okay, it appears to be the manufacturer, but actually Watson doesn't have any factories, doesn't have any pharmaceutical facilities. They travel private pharmaceutical companies to actually create all these vitamins, and when they just rubber stamp their logo, and say, now, yes, this is Watson's. NTUC does us that, okay, if you go to NTUC, when you pick up actually any pack of sugar, they call it NTUC, actually uh, fair price, okay? Or when you go into actually say cold storage, you'll see first choice. These are private brands. So who produces all these private brands? These are private manufacturers who are doing it on behalf of all these giant brands, okay? So no longer do they need to have facilities. They can use their brand, okay? Trouble someone to produce and then they'll go to market, okay? And sell that. Okay, value system, value alignment. When you go to um, actually selling companies, okay, uh, or where patronized selling companies, especially the apparel companies, they'll tell you they use a lot of recycling. Okay, if you go to actually um, places like Lazada, okay, or even at Alibaba, whatsoever, they'll tell you, oh, you know, I have actually a corporate social respons responsibility arm, where every year I'll donate a big amount of money to help the poor. I will try to equip the, the actually the, the rich, okay, I'll, uh, I'll use the rich knowledge, okay, that I have to help the poor to divide and to develop their communities. 
So if you're someone who's very conscious about environment, about helping others who are less privileged, value alignment could be in your blood. And these companies will use value alignments to pull you closer to them. So many companies today adopt CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility Programs. That is because of value alignment. Okay. So in, in Singapore, which companies use this? Um, Body Shop. Body Shop uses this very well. In fact, they are one of the few actually um, cosmetics okay, and, and supplement okay, providers where they hire HIV positive employees. There's something like 36 of them. Right? I mean, if you go to Google, you can find that very easily. So why would actually um, Body Shop want to hire all these HIV positive employees? Okay, because they believe that even though they are HIV positive, they still need to work, they still need to feed themselves, they feed their families. And if you're someone who believes in helping these people who are, may not be so fortunate, okay, you will come to Body Shop, you will actually help me by purchasing an item, and by through your purchase, I will donate a sum to a charity to help these people out. So there's a perfect alignment, okay? You go to a body shop, buy something, they will donate part of the proceeds towards another charity. So you feel good. End of the day, you go out of body shop, you feel good. And body shop doesn't just stop at HIV positive employees. They also are one of the few retail chains that adopts no animal testing. No use of animals, no use of mice in their lab tests. Everything is natural, natural ingredients. So if you're someone who likes organic stuff, you continue to go back to body shop. So that's how important value alignment is, right? And if you use it correctly, you will be able to entice audiences who have never thought about buying you and changing them into one of your strongest advocates. So brand innovation is very, very important today, right? So let's look at Lego. I've used this earlier. So how Lego actually changes itself. Everybody knows about this brick, okay? The famous color brick, okay? Um, Lego gives you your Lego cities. All these are constructed out of Legos. So these ideas can come from where? These ideas come from communities. And Lego uses the Lego brand to extend okay, their product beyond the Lego cities. Lego movies. Okay? In fact, there were two productions of Lego movies. Part one, part two. So they were originally all the one in the toy business. They are the world's third largest toy, toy manufacturer. Why would they want to go into movies production? Why would they want to actually construct campaigns? Why would they want to go into movie or production? Because that is a leverage on one common Lego brand. Okay, the brand is strong enough to allow them to diversify their offerings. And then finally, they go into collaboration with F1s. Okay, that's when they create the collaboration between Lego Ferraris and Lego, right? So F1 have just concluded but Lego is not getting away from this completely. They are the ones who comes to F1 and says, let's work together. Okay, if you pump a full car uh, petrol, full of petrol, you will get actually these collectibles at 690 and it's a collectible, right? So indirectly, it actually allows them to extend okay, their, their, their market branding, their awareness beyond the usual toy users. In this case, kids or even the, actually the grown-up adults. So it's really exciting. Um, and of course, there's something else that I do, do not have in this slide, Lego hotels, okay? There's just one right across the causeway in Malaysia, in Johor Bahru, in Johor. Okay, if you go to a Lego team hotel, it costs a bomb. It's more than $300 a night. But each actually Lego room is different. It carries a different team. So Lego uses the same logo, the same mechanism, the same colors to give you different products. So that's brand extension and brand innovation. It allows you to use a common identity to spread across different sectors, right? So the last one I have is customer engagement. This is number 10, okay? In customer engagement, in essence, we are trying to make customers feel happy. And it's not just about making them happy. We want them to keep coming back asking for more, more and more. Better stay if you never leave us. Never even look at your other competitors. Never look at other businesses as an alternative. I want you to stay put with me throughout. Okay? And in that, we have a few ways. Okay, we have creation, we have community and belonging, we have experience enabling, okay, we have experience simplification, we have personalization, we have mastery, whimsy, and personality. All right? Okay, uh, because of interest of time, um, I'm aware that I've overrun slightly. 
but bear with me a bit more. It's just actually the last few couple of my slides. I want to point you to whimsy and personality. Okay, if you go into Google every day, right? If you use Google search engine like me, every day the the actually the the design of, of the Google page home page is different. Every day, three hundred sixty five days, three hundred sixty five designs. Okay, and every day is always team centric. So it's whimsy and personality at work. So what are they trying to do? They are trying to give the Google search engine a life of its own. They are trying to introduce it as something unique. It's like a human being. Okay, every day you're different. Every day you change your clothes. Every day you actually assume different characteristics. You will behave in a different manner or take on different activities. That's whimsy and personality. Something could be there, but you could give it a life of its own by giving it a name, by giving it a different identity. Okay, you could also use experience uh, like curation. Okay, I tell you, you know, I go around the world, I manage to help you to find the best stuff in the world, artisan brands. Okay, now it's all assembled in one. Okay, and that is exactly what Alibaba, Lazada is doing. They tell you, you know, I've searched the whole of Singapore, I've looked at all the retail brands, I have found some of the best retail brands possible, and now I've assembled them in this common website or this common platform. So you should consider about buying, okay, from me with a sweetener added on top, a discount, okay? So curation is at work. And of course, earlier I mentioned about Lego and many others, okay, community, sense of building a community, an ecosystem. Uh, Apple users, okay, will find very hard to move away from the Apple um, suite of products. Very, very difficult. Because you have your iPhones, you have your I iMacs, Okay, you have your iPads. Once you get one of these i products, okay, and you start to use it, you find it so user friendly. Okay, you wouldn't want to move away from that because by moving away from that, you're leaving the community, you're leaving the ecosystem, and that's exactly where it gets you. They want you to stay forever there, and that's why today diehard Apple fans will still be diehard Apple fans. It's very difficult for, for you to convince them to switch to a Samsung. Okay, similarly, someone who is a new Samsung will not switch to an iPhone. Okay, so this is where community and belonging is at work, right? But um, I would like you to zoom a bit more. Okay, obviously this is Disneyland. This is Walt Disney. So Walt Disney stands out because when you look at actually them, everything that they design, customer engagement, okay, is always orchestra. It's always created. Okay, they have spent a lot of efforts to calculate. Okay, with precision from the time you step through the bin entrance. At the time you see a first pair of Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. To be precise, it should be happening within six minutes. Okay. And every other six to ten minutes, you should see another pair of Mickey Mouse or Minnie Mouse or Donald Duck appearing right in front of you, even though you have just walked past them six minutes ago. So you mean they, they run to meet up with you? Or was it actually curated? It was all curated, it was orchestra. At any stage of time, Okay, Disneyland has six pairs of Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse walking around the park. So don't be too happy. Okay, don't think that, oh, you know, they are chasing you. In fact, they have been there all the while. They just appeared at orchestra times. Okay, so why is it that kids find it fascinating? Because the first thing they want to do is they want to see that Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. It gets them happy. And it, it seems that like Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse is always following them. Okay, and that gets people happy. When kids are happy, parents are happy. When parents are happy, obviously you're more than willing to open up your purse strings, okay, to buy products. So Disney orchestrates this very well, and obviously in their engagement, they're not going to walk back and say, okay, you know, yeah, I only have a team park. I'm going to start things a lot more by giving you cartoons. I'm going to give you a lot of apparels. I'm going to give you an unforgettable night, okay? And in all Disneylands, all theme parks around the world, Disneyland will have a mega actually fireworks, okay, as a finale. That is exactly where Disney experience is being created to the maximum. So it's after careful planning, that's why they can actually have this success for almost decades, right? For so many decades, right? Okay, um, Harvey Davidson, some of you probably hear about all these giant motorbikes, you know, with a very roaring sound before you even spot them. Harvey Davidson creates a cult. Okay, and in this cult, they are very outstanding. They will always wear leather leather jackets with very rugged appearances, unshaven, uh, and usually with very, very big black helmets. And they are always in black. There in Singapore, there's a big Harvey Davidson falling. And these actually bikers, 
would like to pride themselves on the fact they subscribe to the Harvey Davidson rugged and man, man very masculine okay, look of things. So some of them even goes beyond. Okay? They like Harvey Davidson so much, not just by buying bikes, not just by talking about it in forums or committees or going for biking trips together. They even actually tattoo Harvey Davidson on their arms and their legs. Okay, when you reach this level of cult, okay, like environment, that is when your experience innovation or, or customer uh, engagement innovation has reached its peak. Okay, so all companies should work towards that, cultivating a religious group, okay, of diehard supporters. So Apple is another very, very interesting one. Um, Apple has managed to convince a lot of consumers like you and me uh, to spend hours, okay, to queue in front of a retail store hoping for the first product to be launched and you'll be one of the first customers to be paying for that. So that is artificial scarcity at work besides customer engagement innovation. All right. Okay, typically um, I've come to the end of my, my uh, food contents. Okay, unfortunately I would have loved to do a lot more, uh, but I can't in the interest of time. And because it's running also a bit uh, beyond 5.30 that I communicated, Okay, I typically when I go into class, I will actually have a lot of small little games. Okay, this is Renova. Okay, Renova is a Spanish company. Very interestingly, they only deal with one thing and one thing only. Okay, they sell you toilet papers. Right? So you'll be asking, what's so fascinating about toilet papers? Okay, isn't that something that is like almost very boring, very dull, non-exciting? Think again. Okay, go to Renova's website. Okay, Renova sells you the very proposition of having the, the worst sexiest toilets. Okay, and they re-transform toilet paper, something that's white, okay, something that's so boring, something that's so dull. They can make it exciting, they give you vibrant colors, they can find different ways of making you entice or even prepare, okay, to endorse their products. And that's exactly where Renova has gone beyond the norm. They are not a normal toilet paper manufacturer. So in my class, I would like my students to go through this, okay, as a game, as a form of discussion, okay, to build up that familiarity, okay, with the 10 steps of innovation, how you could put that back, okay, into your business arena. So I thought toilet paper is very, very boring. So let's talk about toilet paper, okay. Uh, last but not least, okay, I would have actually um, gone through a fair bit. But um, as part of actually the webinar series, okay, I will have to point you to other webinar series that's coming up as well. I have disruptive business model innovation that's coming up end of the month on the Thursday as well. Uh, so my colleague, okay, Emily, will be sharing that with you if you're interested. Okay, I also have actually two other areas where this content will go into part of the teaching. One of it is a graduate diploma in digital transformation and innovation, where I personally will be guiding and leading the, 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 the teaching. Okay, from Certified Business Innovation. Okay, it's actually a certification program where I walk through all the different types of disruptions, all the different types of innovation, and to build up a very enticing business model, right? So it's not gonna take you too long. It's gonna take you at most about six weeks or so. So that is actually part of a graduate diploma. And last but not least, in the MBAs itself, um, there's also a module called Strategy and Innovation, where parts of the contents will also be mirrored across. But of course, these are structured program, and it's definitely much more um, actually enriching and more insightful versus what I'm, I'm doing right now. So I hope if you have a chance uh, to be part of the class, if you have a, have a actually interest, a certain level of interest, uh, please look at these programs because I, I will be actually the one that's going to work with you through a lot more, okay, about what these have to actually offer, right? Um, questions, anyone, okay, uh, if you're still there with me, okay? Uh, I'm open to any questions, and then we can actually take it forward from there. All right. So, um, okay. Benjamin has a has a question here. Uh, Benjamin, where can we find your videos, webinars on YouTube? Yes. Um, my first webinar can be found on YouTube, um, and that is actually business model innovation. Something very very close to my heart. Uh, something I love a lot something they have been teaching for the last few years. Uh, in fact, it's more important, even more important today. So business model innovation, yes, is there, okay? However, it's a recorded video, okay, done weeks ago. Um, you may find it more meaningful to either refer to a YouTube video. If not, 
you could also look at actually the next upcoming webinar where I'm going to walk through with you about disruptive business innovation, okay? Where we are going to transform, okay? Part of the current business models to something differently, okay? And there are something like 27 different patterns, okay? Uh, I'm still at a crossroad to see whether would I want to build that into part of my teaching in the graduate diplomas or the MBAs, right? Okay, um, any other questions coming from the audience, okay? Uh, besides Benjamin? All right, so maybe we give um, everyone actually a bit of time, okay? Uh, because it's also running a bit close to dinner time, I suppose. Okay, if not, um, if you are looking at these slides, all these slides will also be actually posted into YouTube. Um, if you are looking for any additional um, questions after this, please feel free to reach out to Emily. Emily would be more than happy to help me to answer some of this. Okay. I have a question coming in uh, from an audience. Okay, with all these different innovations, how would we know which types would be suitable for different businesses? Good question, okay. Um, first, I need to know a bit more what businesses. Okay, there is no common innovation that can be easily applied across the board. Okay, but what I can share with you is that all businesses can innovate. Okay. It's just a matter of combinations, right? So typically that here you have gone through 10 types of innovation. Okay, let me share with you the difference between a very successful uh, unicorn and a not so successful average company. Usually when you are very, very average, you will only have three to four types of innovation built in your business model. Okay, it can be any of any three or four of, of what I shared earlier. So they only have three, maximum four types of innovation. The very, very successful businesses like my McDonald's, unicorns like, for example, Alibaba, Grab, okay, Airbnb, okay, or even TikTok, so and so forth. They will have between eight to 10 types of innovation. Okay, so the question here is, besides these 10 types of innovation, what tactics, what strategies must be used? Okay, that is when you have to deep dive. Okay, you have to deep dive to know the, the industry uh, dynamics, you have to examine the company, okay? And you have to look at what resources you have or when you, want to intend, when you intend to take your business forward. Okay, unfortunately in a webinar, it's very difficult for me to share with you how I can transform businesses. But what I can tell you is what you've seen earlier are all the possible techniques and strategies that unicorns have used, okay? In different combinations or different com configurations, all right? So to, to answer your question, um, I will need to know a bit more of context, but I can tell you successful, highly successful businesses will have at least eight types okay, of innovation, right? So obviously in my class, I will try to look at some of these in totality, right? Any other questions that, that, um, that you have, right? Besides this, okay. If not, okay, um, thank you very much for your time again. Um, once again, sorry for stretching a bit beyond. Okay, I will look forward to either seeing you in class or if not during the next webinar that's coming up end of the month. Okay, with that, thank you very much and have a great day ahead. I'll see you soon. All right. Okay, stay safe and stay positive. Right. Thank you.